Welcome to the 17th annual Theodore M. Hesburgh Award and Frank Cahill Lecture. I'm Professor Pat Murphy and will be the MC for this important event. My role will be to introduce several people to you and keep the proceedings on schedule. Our order this afternoon is that we will begin with a few introductions and then turn to the Cahill Lecture, starting with a background on Frank Cahill, whom we honor with the Cahill Lecture given by the four MBA students who are in the front of the room here. Then we'll move to the Hesburgh Award presented to Cummins. First, I'd like to uh, welcome the members of the Cahill family. They have a great turnout and a couple on the way, I hear, so uh, we'll say it's an excused uh, tardiness here. So I'd like to introduce you first to Marty Cahill, who is with us. She's uh, Frank Cahill's widow, um, her son Mike, who's on the way, but he has several members of his family, his uh, uh, wife Mary, son Sean, Kevin, uh, wife Samantha, Colin, and daughter Tara, as well as uh, Suzanne Cahill, who's uh, joining us today and uh, Marty's uh, niece and our uh, local uh, Kathleen Sweeney is with us. So it's great to see all of you here. Second, I'd like to welcome back Tom Leinbarger, who's uh, sitting in the front row, CEO of Cummins, who gave the Hesburgh, uh, excuse me, the Burgess Lecture September 15, is here to accept the Hesburgh Award on behalf of the company. Uh, he's joined by several Cummins executives, Laurel Judkins, Mary Chandler from the Home Office, Raj Singh and his wife Nitti, and uh, Regina Swartzel from Cummins and Elkhart. And third, I'd like to introduce you to my wife Kate, who acted as the chauffeur for Tom and uh, Laurel and Mary. You know, if you want something done, you ask your wife to do it. And uh, who, she actually used to bring, for those young in the audience who haven't been attending before, she actually used to bring Father Ted uh, to this event. And as many of you know, I'm retiring at the end of the year, and I'd like to publicly thank Kate for all of her support. And as someone once said, she's not my better half, she's my better three quarters. <laughs> Now I'll provide uh, a brief background on the Cahill Lecture before we turn to the MBA students. The Frank Cahill Business Ethics Lecture was established after Frank's untimely death from cancer uh, at the age of 59. Frank grew up in Syracuse, New York, and always dreamed of attending Notre Dame. His graduation was the beginning of an abiding connection between the Cahill family and the university. His son uh, Mike is an alum, and Sean uh, also is uh, an alum uh, as well. After earning his BS in commerce, Frank enjoyed a very successful career as an executive in the trucking industry and retired as an officer of Roadway Express. Integrity, character, and ethics were cornerstones of Frank's life and career. Throughout his nearly 40 years in business, Frank experienced firsthand the challenges that arose with a commitment to ethical business practice in the pursuit of both personal and professional success. Frank recognized a real need to introduce young professionals to some of the ethical considerations that they'll face in the business world, and we're going to do that just in a couple minutes with our panel. The Frank Kale Business Ethics Lecture focuses on the core principles of integrity and ethical behavior in the business environment and provides the Notre Dame community with a lasting reminder of Frank's exemplary qualities. So now we'll turn to the Cahill Lecture given by four of our MBA students and I will introduce them uh, in the order that they present. First is Andrew Crown, a second year MBA with corporate finance concentration. He attended the University of Colorado and graduated with a BA in international affairs. He worked previously at Chase Bank where he focused on startups and small business. Last summer he interned with Synchrony Financial and will return there after graduation. Andrew is a big football fan, and his teams are the Colorado Buffaloes, the Denver Broncos, and of course, our own Fighting Irish. Tiffany Lee is a certified public accountant and a Lean Six Sigma Greenbelt. 
Her bachelor's degree is from Marquette University in accounting. While at Notre Dame, she's been active in a number of clubs. Just this last fall, Tiffany was presented with the Dean Wu Leadership Award as voted by our classmates. Upon graduation, she will join the Consumer Banking Products and Strategy Group at Bank of America in Charlotte, North Carolina. Bill Bruner is a second year MBA student with a marketing concentration. He received his undergrad degree from Miami of Ohio and worked in marketing research before returning for his MBA. After graduation, he's accepted a position as assistant brand manager at uh, Procter & Gamble. Last weekend, uh, and I think some of it was held in this room, the McCloskey Business Plan Competition was held here on campus. Last year, Bill and his team won the Best Written Business Plan Award. Our fourth speaker is Elizabeth Betsy Lynch, a second year student with a concentration in finance. She's a native of Michigan and a graduate of the University of Michigan, which we won't hold against her. Uh, her former employer was Electronic Theater Controls, the leading manufacturer of lighting control products for theater and film. And even though they're headquartered in Madison, Wisconsin, its clients were largely from the entertainment capitals of New York, Las Vegas, and Los Angeles. She will continue her career up the road at Whirlpool in Michigan, entering a leadership rotation program uh, with the firm. The students will present in the order that I've introduced them. So Andrew, please begin. Can uh, everyone hear me okay? Well, as Professor Murphy mentioned, I worked at Chase Bank as a small business banker, and the, the way I would describe that position was I was the guy in the suit that sat in the corner, and if someone came into the branch and, and needed uh, to start a business and, and they didn't know the first person to talk to, it was me. And uh, so, of course, I got to meet a lot of interesting folks in that position. But one of the things that people don't recognize, and I certainly didn't recognize when I started the position, is that you actually work on commission when you're working at a branch of a bank. We'd get paid you know, $12 for every credit card that we'd open or a certain percentage of every loan, things like that. Now, from, a, from an ethical standpoint, the way our uh, compensation was set up is we had to sell seven new bank accounts every month to get our commission check. So regardless of whatever else we did, if we didn't get those seven accounts, we got $0. Now, there were certain times at the end of the month where you didn't have those seven accounts and you otherwise would have, in some cases, a couple thousand dollars worth of commission riding on it. And if anyone's followed the news and seen what happened at Wells Fargo, you can recognize that it certainly leads to an ethical dilemma, especially when you consider the fact you're dealing with bankers at hundreds of branches all across the country with this type of compensation plan. So my advice to individuals who are working on commission in these situations is to be very proactive and talk to your manager in situations like this. You know, when I was in that situation, it's a lot easier to recognize that that might be an ethical concern early in the month than on the 30th day of the month, the branch is closing in an hour and you still gotta get another account in order to get your commission check. And ideally, you would have a great manager that works with you on that. But if not, being able to think of situations in advance to deal with that situation is incredibly helpful as someone who's uh, new in the industry. It's almost like sports. If you think, if you ever played sports before, you always want to visualize your success and visualize what you're going to do in a certain situation. That way, when you get on the field or the court, you can act on that situation. And I think the same comes with ethics in a situation like that. Uh, another quick example is uh, I mentioned that we uh, credit cards were part of our portfolio and usually what would happen is uh, we would always uh, do what was best for the customer. We believe that long-term relationships are much better than short-term profit. But uh, occasionally that, uh, that pressure of those sales numbers would, would get to the managers and I remember one situation my manager came to me and said, Andrew, credit card numbers are low, every person you sit with needs a credit card. Well, that makes no sense whatsoever in any other context. But it's as funny as it is to say outside of that, once you get into the pressure of, of a sales environment, those situations do sometimes come up. 
And so in that situation, it all comes back to having a dialogue with your manager and be able to take a step back and realize the long-term implications of what you're doing. So to any uh, of the undergraduates that are going to be in that similar position in a, in a few short months or maybe a, a year from now, uh, definitely you want to be proactive when it comes to your compensation, your relationship with your managers, because I definitely think it can be helpful in uh, helping you out through some ethical concerns. Thanks. As Professor Murphy mentioned, I'm a certified public accountant. I have experience in audit and tax. Um, I'll first give an audit perspective. Um, I worked for one of the major accounting firms, and I also was a junior a, um, basic just associate and also rose to the position of a senior associate. So I'll talk about things that I faced very, very early in my career. Um, in public accounting, there's a lot of turn turnover on on jobs. There might be someone may leave the firm, someone may um, leave to go to another project, and oftentimes some work is left unfinished, and someone has to finish it. And there may be times when you're asked to sign off on work that you did not complete, com that you didn't work on completely. There may be one or two things that you might have to tidy up, and then the, um, the work needs to be needs to have someone's signature, and then it also needs to have the manager's signature. Um, there were times when I was asked to do this, and it was very uncomfortable because I didn't do the work, or you know, it was a very large work paper that had so many different layers, but instead of just signing off on it without knowing, because thing thing that will happen is that someone will likely come and ask you a question about it. If not in the next few months, then even the next year, when they're looking at prior year work papers to get an understanding and they reach out to you like, oh, who worked on this? And so the thing that I always made sure to do is if someone else worked on it as well, their name was, on the, was listed as um, on the work paper as well as having done some work. And also, I would review the work papers to make sure that I would come to the same conclusions as they did. Um, by reviewing the supporting documentations and really making sure that I was comfortable signing off on it and didn't just do it blindly. So these types of things happen very often because you know, there's just a high number of turnover for a number of reasons. So I definitely recommend that before you sign, put your signature on anything that says that you completed it, that you make sure that you um, really reviewed it or at least did the work yourself. The other example is from a tax perspective. Um, I initially, as I mentioned, grew up as a, an auditor, but later in my career, I learned how to do personal taxes. And um, I served creative and artsy type clients. Accounting, taxes were not their thing at all. So sometimes they would come in with some very um, loose support for their tax returns. Um, and I, rem I distinctly remember um, one client coming in and said, oh, it's just the same numbers as last year. What was your business mileage? Mm, about the same as last year. Really? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, it's, it's one thing if it's maybe your cell phone bill. That tends to not maybe fluctuate so much. Or your internet bill that oftentimes can be consistent year over year or you know, a Netflix subscription. However, all of your expenses can't end in double zero. That's just impossible. <laughs> so I, there's one return that I um, worked on in 2015. I never finished it. I never filed it because the client never came back to me with some, with some substantial evidence or even concrete numbers for his expenses. And I never worked with him again because I was not comfortable putting my license on the line because he was too lazy to keep good records. So this, this can be applied both professionally and personally. You know, from, your, from a personal standpoint, if you have business-related expenses or even anything that relates to your tax return, you want to make sure that you have proper support for that. And if you're having someone else prepare your tax returns, making sure that you know, you can, you, you put faith in your numbers and that you can back it up if you're ever audited by the IRS. And thank you.
So I worked at a uh, marketing research consultancy, so we would provide uh, an unbiased consumer perspective for different uh, Fortune 500 companies in the CPG or automobile or financial space. And one of the uh, ethical issues that would come up would be that they would have a agenda of what results they would like to see. And they're your, they're your client, so you want to continue to win business with them and you want to continue to uh, build a relationship and have them come back. But you have a responsibility to the company and to the consumer and to yourself uh, to make sure that what you're providing is the accurate information. So uh, some of the safeguards that I took when I, I, uh, was that made sure that I had uh, multiple people look over the, the data so that when they came back and said, I've been working for, in this for 30 years, you've been working in this for two years, this, this isn't uh, correct, we know that this is what the consumers are saying. We had multiple people uh, and trying to find an advocate in a, a position that's higher than you, like a manager or even somebody else that can uh, help back you up there uh, to try to make sure that uh, the work that you have found gets presented in the right way and to make sure that it gets kept uh, in, the, in the business when it's passed on to other people. I made sure that I PDF'd everything that I sent because uh, there had been issues of some PowerPoint slides mysteriously missing uh, in uh, when it would come back in, as, as prior research. So um, PDF and always, uh, I would just take on that little bit of extra work of if they had changes, they could ask and then we could verify that that is something that we would be able to change or something that should be left out. Um, another, uh, ethical situation that came up uh, would be when we were creating the bid process. So we'd get a, a request for proposal, an RFP, and you you want to win that business. But so there was kind of, there was a strategy that we felt that some of uh, people would do of bid really low, and then when they when it started going, then just keep increasing the price, increasing the price, increasing the price, and to try to, when when I would see. When we kept losing bids because our price was too high, uh, we tried to work through how we could uh, make sure that we continue getting some business. So we would actually show them some more of our, our line items. We tried to um, go through a more, a more transparent process. And what we ended up finding was it was OK to lose those bids that they were going strictly on the, the, the price. Uh, because what ended up happening is when you were trying to do the, the research later after you'd won the, the bid, they would nickel and dime on every little thing. So it was better to uh, be transparent and say, this is the price and we're not going to go any higher than 10%. If, if things get added and it goes higher than 10%, we'll incur that cost. And those were better long-standing relationships. So it was uh, a good reminder that sometimes it's okay to lose those, those short-term battles to try to gain uh, those strong relationships into the future. Hey, you guys. Uh, so as Professor Murphy mentioned, I worked for Electronic Theater Controls, which is a B2B business primarily. And my role was in client relationship management. And so um, my firm, just to give you an example, uh, served mostly commercial clients and mostly commercial uh, electrical distributors. So for example, if you were building the Mendoza College of Business, uh, you would come to my firm and ask for all of the lighting and electrical needs for the entire building. So that's a, a huge, long order, um, maybe hundreds, thousands of parts that are all coming from us on a single order. Um, so other names for this job might be an account manager, uh, like an associate account executive, other than just my job, client relationship manager. And so some of these clients, I worked there for five years, and some of them I started talking to, you know, my first few weeks on the job, and I heard about their families. I heard about, you know, all the different businesses they're involved in and the exciting buildings that they're putting up. And then you also talk to clients that are notoriously difficult to work with. Um, they're unreasonable. They're frequently angry. You know, they're always calling you at the last minute and blaming you for things that are out of your control. Um, but they're still clients that the firm has worked with for 20 years. And so maintaining those relationships and staying uh, ethical and honest and kind of consistent between clients, despite that you have obvious sort of 
better relationships with people that are nicer to you and that um, you know you like to talk to on the phone is difficult. And so that was sort of something that I, uh, over five years, uh, you're able to hone that skill, but it's something you need to be aware of from the beginning. You're always going to want to be nice to the person that uh, is kind and talks to you versus somebody that's always ca calling you angry. But ultimately, they're both clients and they're both very important to the life of the firm. And the more that you can stand consistent uh, over the long run is going to serve you better. My second example is about making judgment mistakes. Um, so I mentioned that my firm shipped out giant orders at a time um, to construction sites that are underway, you know, mud pits, uh, concrete's being poured, and you'd frequently store these items in just like trailers. I mean, you can see them over at the stadium. So I would send out 200 items to a job site, and the protocol for construction is someone would check in every item. And some of these items might be on their own pallet, you know, they're 2,000 pounds and they had to be forklifted off a truck, all the way down to a light switch on the wall that's three inches by four inches. They're all on the same bill of materials and there's some man or woman in a trailer checking them all off. And so all day you'll get phone calls or emails about where's my shipment, when are you sending it, how many are you sending, and commonly, hey, I found... 198 of the 200 that are on this list, but I'm missing two of them. And that's an opportunity where you're making a judgment call. Uh, maybe this is a long-standing client that you've done a lot of jobs with that you know is very consistent um, with checking in items. A light switch for my firm, you know, it's less than a dollar to manufacture. So I can garner some goodwill with that client by sending them a new one. Um, even though I know my shipping department is really good at this stuff, I know that those switches are on site, but do I want to tell a client to, hey, I know you spent all day checking in things, can you go look again? Um, but then there's also times where, you know, you have an angry person on the phone that has spent all day looking and they're taking that out on you and, you know, this person has called every day this week to complain that they can't find something and there's a judgment over whether do I give that goodwill or do I go back and maybe do some more due diligence with FedEx or call the manufacturing floor and figure out what this box looks like so I can help this person uh, find it on site. And when you're making these decisions every day, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to take maybe the way where you send them the box to get them less angry, to get them to stop calling you. Um, and yeah, you maybe cost the firm only a few dollars and that customer was happy for at least the next two hours, but <laughs> you, you'll feel it that this is a point where I let somebody take advantage of me and I didn't, um, you know, I, I, I didn't do the little bit of due diligence that I could have done and everybody's gonna make mistakes and it's whether when you feel that you say, hey, that was a mistake, let me do better next time, let me recognize that earlier. Or are you going to say, hey, that was an easy way out. Um, I'm going to maybe do that more often. And the more that you can listen to that feeling, everybody has it, and recognize it and own up to that mistake, um, especially when in a client role like mine, no one is checking my work, uh, that's where you, know, you can really feel proud about kind of the ethics that you uphold. Very good. We have a few minutes uh, for questions to any of our panelists. Uh, Who will be first? Marty, yes. Uh, on, 
I think one thing that I had had uh, coming out of undergrad was I had thought that a lot of those situations were going to happen way above my pay grade. But what I realized <laughs> is that, that you have to, a lot of those things will sometimes uh, come come down to you. Uh, so I think that. Uh, in most of those situations, I I'm very fortunate that I was never put in a position where it was, you either do this or you're fired. Um, but I think part of that was uh, I found a company, even though it was, it, that it was small, and, and if I said the name, no one ha would have heard of it, but I, I felt a connection there that I, I felt that it was a, an honest culture. Uh, so that was something that just, I think I spent a good amount of time before I went somewhere and found a place that I, I thought that uh, we were on the same page of our, our morals and ethics, and so that, I think, made it easier that a lot of times if, I, if something came to me, I was like, I don't feel right about this. Uh, I know a lot of places you can't go above your boss, but I, this was an environment where I could, so I, w I would if I had to. You yeah, have Oh, how about that? Okay. To, to, to echo what Bill said, I, I, I agree that that was one of my big uh, uh, takeaways. I thought that ethical decisions would all happen by uh, adults in the corporate office, and, and they wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't be asking some 22-year-old to, to make ethical decisions. And, and kind of the opposite of Bill's situation, when I was working J.P. Morgan Chase, they have a, a policy and procedure that's, you know, 200 pages thick that covers every conceivable situation, and I'm sure there's some in that organization that say, you know, if you just follow the procedure, that uh, that the ethics will, will will take care of themselves. And, and, and what I found is that you, even if it was if it was a thousand pages long, you can't cover every single ethical situation. And and thankfully, I was never put in a position where it was either me or my job, but it was definitely a, a realization that you had to exercise some thinking beyond just what the, the policies and procedures said because there were times that you either had to go beyond what the policy said to reach an ethical outcome or sometimes the, there were situations like, for example, the bank, you know, someone needed cash and didn't have an ID on them. Well, the policy says, tough luck. That might not be the ethical situation, and so you would have to figure out, okay, how can I work around this? And I was fortunate to have supportive management that they usually understood if I had to go outside of what was quote unquote required, um, that if it was a, an ethical situation and I could understand the risks, that it was, it was better, everyone was better off. Yes, Elizabeth? How was your time at Notre Dame better prepared to prepare to face this challenge as a new mom? I will say that from the the two ethics classes that I've taken and just numerous ethical discussions in class, it's really caused me to do a lot of introspection about the things that I've encountered over the course of my career to think, would I have done that differently? And um, to really think critically about situations that I could face in the future. So I definitely feel that Notre Dame has, um, has further deepened my, my own ethical um, framework and my culture because you know, some of my experience has been pretty varied, but I know that going forward, you know, moving up the corporate ladder, those decisions are going to get tougher and tougher. And I do believe that Notre Dame has prepared me for that. Yeah, I can speak to that as well. Um, one of the most, I, I guess, remarkable things about my two years here is all of the constant exposure to decision making. Like I was actually, I just came from my negotiations class and in that class, they're asking you, you know, how much information do you reveal to a counterparty when you're negotiating something? Um, and in my previous work experience, uh, that I guess I, I sort of experienced that, but I didn't know how to define it. And that's what a lot of my experience at Notre Dame has done. Um, in my previous work, you know, we had, I dealt a lot with schools and um, non for profit organizations, you know, maybe even elementary schools where they're uh, ordering new systems. And we have policies where if it's within one year of shipping, we cover the shipping on that. And if someone offers to ship it back to me at their cost, you know, I could say, hey, uh, yeah, sure, that'd be great. You know, pay the bill. Here's our address. Please, you know, address it to me. Um, but it's my responsibility to say, no, you know, educate them on the warranty and say, hey, I'll cover that. Um, you have an email address, like let me send you, uh, let me send you a packing slip. Um, and that's what Notre Dame has prepared me to do. You know, 
ask those questions and tie them back to things I've experienced so that going forward, when I experience similar things, I can anchor uh, those judgments in this education. One more question. Professor Milani. I have an Angela question. Um, did you know you were going to be on a commission basis only, or did Chase kind of pull the wool over your eyes because you were so young? <laughs> No, I, I knew going in that uh, that it would be commissioned. That was something that went over in the interview. But uh, before the application process, I had uh, I had no idea, and uh, it definitely took some some getting used to because I, I didn't think I would be working on commission, and it definitely uh, does take some getting used to if you're if you're not used to having a paycheck that's going to fluctuate. Well, join me in thanking all of our panelists, and I'm sure they're willing to stay around. Hopefully their excellent presentations gave you uh, some things to think about, and if you have specific questions you want to direct to any of the panelists, they will be here uh, after the rest of the ceremony is over. So thank you very much. Now we're moving to the Theodore Hesburgh Awards Ceremony. And as you know, Father Ted died uh, just two years ago in February of 2015 and was 97 years old. I've asked Father Oliver Williams, a member of the management faculty and a fellow uh, Congregation of Holy Cross colleague who knew Father Ted very well over many years, to offer a few words of introduction to a man who frankly needs no introduction uh, on this campus. Father Ollie? Thank you, Pat. So uh, the challenge that I have is to explain to you why an award for the premier business leader of the year is named after a priest who many would say never did any business. Uh, before I get into that, I do want to say I'm delighted to be here uh, that in the year this award is going to Cummins Engine. Uh, my first academic research article was on Cummins. Uh, and as you know, uh, you have to not only be a good teacher to get tenure at this university, you have to publish research. They call it publish or perish. In my case, it was publish or perish. <laughs> so, I was delighted uh, to go down to Columbus, Indiana and who was my host but J. Irwin Miller, the founder of uh, Columbus. He took me in like a son for three or four days, introduced me to all the top leaders, helped me write a very, very good article, which I might say was published at, at Cal Berkeley Business Journal, which is one of the better ones. Um, it's probably out of date a little now, but uh, I certainly was impressed then that uh, Cummins was one of the better companies in the United States, if not the world. But jumping back to the, my assignment here, why did we name it after the award for the premier business leader after uh, Father Ted? You know, when we founded, I wasn't here, they founded the business school early in the 20th century. Cardinal John O'Hara founded it. And his uh, vision then was that business should be a force for good and that we would be unique in the United States in our focus on business ethics. So way before it was fashionable, the Notre Dame Business School uh, had a central focus on business ethics. Uh, about 15 years ago, we decided we should give an award for uh, a premier business leader to highlight uh, the good work the company was doing and to highlight the fact that the Mendoza College of Business is focused on ethics and business. So we have put a little committee together and we said, well, what characteristics should this person have that we name the award after? And so uh, they said, primarily an entrepreneur who has been very successful while at the same time 
uh, embodying ethics and known for an ethical corporate culture for his organization, his or her organization. And so this went round and round. One of the members of the committee said, I think we should name it after Father Ted Hesburgh. And um, I thought this was a great idea. He's always been a friend of mine, uh, was. Uh, but I said, I'll have to recuse, recuse myself from this uh, judgment because uh, of who I am. But it went uh, on for several meetings, and, and finally we decided that indeed the award should be named the Reverend Theodore M. Hesburgh Award for Business Ethics. Uh, as you know, he was president here for 35 years. He uh, enhanced uh, the building, uh, the endowment, uh, most of all the academic uh, quality of the University of Notre Dame. When he took over uh, his first year, uh, he always used to tell me at the press conference, they threw him a football. <clears throat> and uh, he said, when I'm finished, they'll throw me more than a football. <laughs> In any event, uh, I'm delighted that we have the Theodore M. Hesburgh Award for Business Ethics, and we'll now proceed with that award. Thank you, Ollie. Uh, over the, the years, a number of people have asked me how a uh, company is selected for the Hesburgh Award, and uh, students uh, over time in my MBA marketing ethics class uh, in the fall semester have nominated various firms for the award, and uh, this year's recipient was nominated by Robbie Mira and Garrick Meinhardt. Since they've already graduated, uh, I will share with you a few major points from their paper. Uh, introduce uh, Tom Leinbarger, the CEO, who's here to accept the award. And after my summary and introduction, we'll have a few photos, and then Tom will uh, uh, join, join us for his remarks. So this is the Robbie and Garrick's seven-page paper that I'm going to try to take a, just a few paragraphs uh, from. So here's what they had to say. The company that we believe best espouses the values of the Hesburgh Award is Cummins. The company is a global power leader in engines and related technology and is based in Columbus, Indiana. And Tom will share more detail on the expansiveness of their firm now. The report that the students did demonstrates uh, how the co company embodies the spirit of the Hesburg Award by incorporating four criteria. First, sound ethical business practice, second, environmental policies, third, social responsibility, and fourth, corporate governance. The ethical dimension, uh, first, Cummins has a code of business conduct, which is a 29-page document uh, with a note from Chairman Tom about the uh, 10 ethical principles, and I also add that they have six corporate values, three of which are integrity, corporate responsibility, and diversity. Uh, the code is impressive in that it has revised uh, recently in 2016, and if you look on their website, it has been translated into 16 languages. A very positive sign that ethics and values are lived throughout the company is that employees at all levels are frequently reminded that they have an obligation to report suspected violations of the company's code. Finally, on this section, Cummins strives to engage in business with suppliers that share its passion for sustainable practices and policies, so they enforce a supplier code of conduct that includes provisions such as child labor, human rights, and safe work environment. Uh, second, on the environmental dimension, Cummins publishes an annual sustainability report. Um, the latest, I believe, is 2015-16. It's their 12th uh, report, and they participate in the Global Reporting Index, an initiative that we have uh, uh, taught about in our classes. It focuses on the areas of sustainability, product safety, diversity, leadership, and several others. Uh, one other topic the students focused on in this section was uh, the initiative the Cummins has undertaken on water conservation. As part of its new environmental sustainability plan, Cummins aims to reduce its direct water access across the company by 33% with a deadline of 2020. The third is the social dimension. 
Cummins has a long history of corporate social responsibility, most no notably through Every Employee, Every Community initiative. In this initiative, Cummins enables all their employees to work up to four hours every week on company time on various charitable projects throughout the community wherever they live, and two-thirds of the employees have participated. And this EEEC is based on the company's core values of serving and improving communities in which Cummins lives, and Father Williams mentioned J. Irwin Miller, and it harkens back to his statement in 1972 where he said, we have a responsibility to use part of our resources to respond to the needs of society. We can be a healthy community only insofar as we exist and serve within an economically and socially healthy society. Uh, beyond these activities, Cummins is well known for their architecture program, and any of you who have visited the city of Col Columbus, Indiana, know all about that. The final dimension is the governance uh, one. Cummins has a longstanding history of sound ethical corporate governance. Uh, in 2012, uh, they created a position of vice president of ethics and compliance, their first corporate level ethics officer, and uh, Mr. Leinbarger stated the appointment reflects the growing difficulty that Cummins faces as it attempts to adhere to its code of conduct across a growing global organization. The students concluded, and I'll just share with you their last paragraph, and as the professor, they hearken back to some of our ethical theories, and this is what they had to say. These actions by Cummins are consistent with duty-based ethics, treating people as an end, and virtue ethics, fairness, integrity, transparency, and set a good example for business students and professionals alike. Cummins will likely continue to face ethical issues associated with the growth of its global brand, but given the company history and structure, should be well placed to continue to make a lasting and positive impact in the communities that it serves. And now to just share with you a, a bit of the biography of Tom Leinbarger, who served as chairman and CEO since January of 2012. He previously served uh, numerous leadership positions at the company, including president and COO from 2008 to 2011. Tom received a joint undergraduate degree in management engineering from Claremont McKenna College and mechanical engineering from Stanford University. He returned to Stanford to earn two master's degrees, one in manufacturing systems from the School of Engineering and an MBA from the Graduate School of Business. Tom has been on the board of directors of Harley-Davidson since 2008. He's a board member of the US-China Business Council and Energy Systems Network and serves as chair of the Business Roundtable Committee on International Engagement. Along with his wife, Michelle, Tom is very much involved in the education and development of their two daughters, Alex and Emily. So please uh, give Tom Leinbarger a very Warm Notre Dame welcome as we present the award and take a couple of photos here. Uh, Father Williams and Bob Bernhardt, uh, who's a member of the Board of Directors of Cummins, please come up and let's get one with uh, all of us. Okay, I believe I'm on. Is that what you guys think? Good, okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Pat. Um, I'm just incredibly honored uh, to be here on behalf of Cummins and our 55,000 people. It's, it's really an honor to accept this award. And um, we have some great people from Cummins here who are very kind to join us. Raj and Niti from Elkhart, Gina from Elkhart, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Laurel, Mary, 
and Bob and Debbie for on the board. It's really nice to have all of you here to help help uh, accept this award because this is a definitely an award on behalf of all the people that work at the company and frankly those shoulders that we stand on uh, from the past of the company. You'll, you'll learn more about that. Before I begin though, I do need to thank Notre Dame. I need to thank the Center for Religious Values and Business and Institute for Ethical Business Worldwide. And of course I have to thank the Cahill family. Uh, this is the second time I've, I've presented here and that's in, in, involved in things that you sponsor, lecture series that you sponsor. And, and frankly, I think your contributions are preparing students for the kind of issues they're gonna face in the workplace. And I think ma making the world better as a result because as I look at it, I don't really see a way to separate ethics and business leadership. To me, they're one and the same. And hopefully you'll hear about that as we uh, think about, as we talk about Cummins. But I, I knew, also need to thank Pat. When I heard uh, about the retirement, I have to say I had mixed emotions. I was happy for you and happy for Kate, but I, I was also thinking to myself that uh, the service that you provide to this university and frankly to the business students is one uh, that will be missed. Um, again, for the same reasons, I feel that you know, we're better off because we produce business leaders that think about ethics as part of the job they have to do. And so thanks for all your contributions over the years, Pat. Thank you. You know, I, I obviously feel strongly about the importance of business and ethics, um, but at Cummins, our case, I think, brings out why I believe that. It's true that we have been incredibly successful, and I'll talk about how our company has grown. But I believe that our company has grown not despite the fact that we've been focused on values, but because we've been focused on values. It's just the fact that we started where we started as a small Midwest company and thought that values mattered, and the fact that we connected our, our, our operations around the globe with these values as the core and the center, that I think we succeeded among uh, an environment full of competitors ready to eat our lunch every day, I think that those values are what made it work. So that's the case I'm gonna try to make to you today. And um, I'll, I'll spend a few minutes talking about where it all comes from, but I hope that when I end, that what you'll understand is that our approach to vision, mission, values, and ethical practices has everything to do with our business success. That's where I hope I, I finish. All right, so let's get started here. I have some neat photos to start with. It, it may seem odd to think of a diesel engine company uh, in this day and age as an entrepreneurial company, but, but we, we were an entrepreneurial company. We started as a startup. In fact, in 1919, the fellow up on the upper left there, that's Clessy Cummins, and he was really the founder of the company. Clessy Cummins was a mechanic, an inventor, pretty, pretty good with a wrench and pretty good uh, technically. And he convinced uh, W.G. Irwin there to fund him to import the license for the diesel engine from a company called MAN. It's a German company where Rudolf Diesel worked. And Rudolf Diesel uh, licensed the engine to Cummins, the technology for the diesel engine, in 1919. So the start of Cummins. And W.G. Irwin, by the way, was a venture capitalist. Uh, W.G. Irwin was the uh, great uncle of Irwin Miller. And he thought that if I have entrepreneurs here starting companies, they'll come to my bank and put money in it, and they'll come to my store and buy stuff. Good thinking, right? So venture capitalist, entrepreneur, start the company back in 1919. When the company started, all the truck companies had their own gasoline engines and definitely did not need a diesel engine from somebody else because they had their own manufacturing plants, their own engines. What do they need with a diesel engine? So what, what did uh, Classy Cummins do? He barnstormed the US, drove across the US convincing truck buyers that if they could get a diesel engine, they'd be better off. So he, they needed to tell these truck companies to get the gasoline engine out and put this Cummins diesel en engine in. So here he is hanging out of that bus because he's gone from New York to Los Angeles, 3,000 miles on $11.22 of diesel. Right. So that's how he got people to try it. And finally, he got one company to say to the, to the truck companies, I'll only buy the truck if you put a diesel engine in from Cummins. And that's how Cummins was born. Now, like a normal startup, it also took him quite a while to turn that into a profit. In fact, Cummins didn't make a profit for nearly 20 years. Sounds like a startup, right? 20 years. Uh, but we did. We got, we got, this, we got the company going. And, and from there, began to develop um, as a full-fledged business, making money, building out across the US. Again, thanks to, to the entrepreneurial spirit of Clessy 
and frankly, the support of the, the Irwin and Miller family. Now today, uh, look where Cummins is. So we're in 190 countries, 55,000 employees, nearly $18 billion in sales across the world. We make engines, we make power generators, we make technologies that make the engine cleaner, better fuel efficiency, and perform better. And you know, we are now de designing, developing, and manufacturing project products on six continents. So we're still headquartered, by the way, in Columbus, Indiana, in the site where Klessy started the company. And yet, look at the reach of the company. So it's pretty remarkable to think of a company founded in Columbus, Indiana, so we could get more customers for the general store, now standing here. Right? And you know, I, I think most of us that stand here today in the company feel a responsibility to continue that legacy, to be stewards of this amazing company that's been created. So let me, and I'll come back to that. So if, if Klessy was the founder of the product and the technology and the, and the entrepreneurial spirit behind the company, J. Irwin Miller was the, the, the sponsor and founder of Values. So the company started to understand the importance of values thanks to J. Irwin Miller. So as I mentioned, he was in the Miller and Irwin families. He uh, worked for Cummins for a short while, then he went into the Navy, and when he came back from World War II, he was put in charge of the company at a very young age. And he, has a, he had a very unusual resume to be the CEO of a manufacturing company. He studied theology and classics at Oxford. He grew up in a religious family. He thought about the job of leadership very, very differently than most CEOs do. He wrote on uh, ethics and, and, and the importance of social responsibility, as you heard in the quote. He also was a, the first lay president of the National Council of Churches, and he marched with Martin Luther King. Okay, not what you'd expect from a Midwest manufacturing company. There's an, there's an old story about how when the unions came in to, to form, uh, to, 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 uh, to get workers into the union, and all the manufacturing companies in Indiana and Ohio that were doing automotive manufacturing and other things, they, uh, many people tried to block the unions. In fact, they, had, they hired thugs to block them with sticks and other things to keep the unions away. And Erwin Miller said, no, we're not going to have sticks or, or, or well, if, the, if the employees want to unionize, they can unionize. It's up to them. Let's make the case as to what our, what our company stands for, and they can choose. And indeed, they did unionize at that time, but they unionized under a, the Diesel Workers Union, which is it's, it's a company union, and they did it in cooperation with management to say, here's, here's what our demands are. Now, you can argue, you can have your own view about unions, but I think it talks about the way that Erwin Miller thought about problems at the time and the, and, and the way that that way of thinking is, was so different than other people at its time. And, and it's just that kind of thinking that forms the legacy of the company. You know, for first of all, values integrated into business. He knew no other way to do it. I mean, he really wasn't a business school student. He was a values and ethics and broad thinker who got put in a business situation. So no choice, no other way to do it. He embraced the stakeholder model, which means he thought about the company's responsibilities as shareholders, yes, but also employees, also customers. Also communities, just as the quote said. So communities, if the community wasn't healthy, the people weren't going to want to work there because the schools wouldn't be good and the housing wouldn't be good, so you wouldn't get anybody good to work there. If you didn't get anybody good to work there, customers wouldn't be happy. And if customers weren't happy, no money, shareholders lose. It, it's kind of obvious in retrospect, but at the time, remember, nobody thought that. Everybody thought that you did this work with for... for um, communities or for charities because, just because it was a good thing to do. And you did it against the will of your shareholders. And Erwin Miller's view was there's not a trade-off between uh, doing well for these other stakeholders and your shareholders' welfare. It's a necessary partnership. If you want your company to do well, you need to do well by all these things. Right? And in fact, uh, this uh, is, a, is, a, is a really neat connection for us. So it turns out that Father Hesper gave Erwin Miller an honorary degree at Notre Dame, which was a neat connection. And I brought with me a, the, the quote from this speech, which, uh, cause I, just because I loved it, and it's, it's amazing. Um, and this quote from this 
uh, session actually was in our 1972 annual report. Here's what it said. This was from Father Hesburgh himself. In deciding to be a neighbor in the greater world community, he, this is Erwin Miller, chose not to play it safe. He accepted the involvement, the commitment, and the risk demanded of the role. A prominent lay churchman, he has urged that we speak out against poverty, racism, social injustice with the anger of the prophets in voices impatient with complacency, conformity, and gradualism. And he's led by example, direct, directing his business comp components to help solve the social problems of the communities in which they operate. A man who exercises the social responsibility of business without compromise. So then Sir Owen put, Miller put that in the 1972 annual report. So that's the legacy that, that we all come to work at Cummins with behind us. These are big shoes to fill. Right? Managing your inventory just isn't going to do it. It's, I mean, you got to do that, but it's not going to be enough, is it? And frankly, when I decided to come to Cummins, I came here because I read those quotes. Those are the quotes that I read in the, the Career Center at Stanford Business School that said, this is the place I want to work. It was just that definition of what leadership means and what business leader responsibility is that drew me here. And I think it draws scores of people, talented people, to come to work for a Midwest manufacturing company that otherwise would not come. So I'm, my opinion, his legacy you know, is what attracted many of the talented people that, that, that work at Cummins today. And so as we then move on through the company, starting from that small Midwest manufacturing company, getting our engines out, starting to become bigger, th during the 1960s, we began to expand internationally. We started doing joint ventures around the world. We started a full global strategy in 1979. The company's now getting up into the several billion dollars a year in sales range. Um, and by the time the, the last decade comes around, you know, nearly half of our business is overseas. And now it's, you know, that's normal for us, half of our business. And in fact, in, in some years, it's been as high as 60% of our business outside the US. And, and what did that bring? That brought diversity in the workforce. Not, not just uh, uh, visible diversity, but invisible diversity too. We had people with all kinds of different backgrounds, out, different languages, uh, different, uh, and not, not just engineers and mechanical engineers anymore, the whole range. And, and that meant the company was changing inside. And so the, the question was, how does the management build on the legacy that, that, er, that Erwin Miller left? You know, take that strength, but make sure that it stays relevant for, for our workforce today, who are now facing ethical challenges and, and business problems that are totally different than the ones he was facing then. And, we needed to make sure that we talked about that with our employees and did it in a way that gave them direction and, and inspiration and motivation. So in 2001, uh, roughly, maybe 2000, we put out our first new set of mission, vision, and values. So everyone was kind of scared to touch them, to be honest. Because remember, this is, these are Erwin Miller's values. So you just didn't mess with Erwin Miller's values. But the stories were, around the company were ripe. We, we knew there was something to build on, and we wanted to make sure it was relevant to our modern company. So we, we, we put together a set of mission, vision, values in the early 2000s. And that's where all the, the, the values that, that, that uh, uh, Father Murphy mentioned, that they either, it was integrity and diversity and innovation, community involvement, delivering superior results, and global in involvement. Th those were all part of that set of, the, of values that we launched then. And I will say that those values that we talked about have st stood the test of time. How can you tell? Well, from 2000, when we launched those, until today, Cummins stock price has grown by 20 times. Right? Our business continues to, to grow around the world. Oh, we, have par we have partnerships that we've had for more than 25 years. I celebrated our 25th anniversary with our Chinese joint venture partner just a couple of years ago in China. And this is, you know, these kind of relationships and business success uh, come from having this consistency of values and reputation and ethical practices. That's why we're able to maintain those. You can form a joint venture any day you want. If you want to hold a joint venture for, tw for 25 years with somebody, you better operate in a consistently, ethically, and upstanding way, because they're just not going to stay with you otherwise. So that, that's the, 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 the reputation we, we've been able to build, and that's the reputation we want to uphold. And I think, again, standing on that legacy, 
is what allowed us to do it, and then being brave enough to step into the future and say, yeah, we, we want to have that legacy, but we need to make sure we're speaking to today's people and keep on leading from the front. So this is a, a, a framework that, that I've put together since I've come in as CEO to help me think about what does this responsibility mean? It, because I, yeah, I feel such a high level of accountability for making sure that this legacy was, that was, was, was built is not lost, and in fact is enhanced over time. So this is the framework that I think about for value, integrating values and making sure our ethical practices live up to our reputation every day. First, take that legacy and keep building on it. I, I mentioned the one case where we, we launched the new mission, vision, values, and now my staff is doing the same thing. So my staff, none of whom were on the leadership team in 2000, are now doing the mission, vision, values again. You might think, well, why would you do that? Do them all, you already got them. But remember, a lot's changed in the last 15 years. And these leaders need to believe in these values so much so that they have to be their words because it's not just about posters. It's not about posters or three by five cards or slogans. It's about do you believe them enough to act on them every day? Do you talk, is it how you make decisions? Or is it you know, some sort of theoretical framework? So we, I want to make sure that we say, we, we tell our people, this is what we believe, and we intend to act on it every day, and you can hold us accountable for it. So we're doing it's the second round of this mission, vision, values, and we're, we're going to roll it out in July. So I'm really excited about that. And secondly, that tone at the top, and, and, and I think the tone at the top comes from not just having, again, the posters, but believing it so, is so core to your business that it's, it is what makes you successful. It's not something you do because it's, someone said it's the right thing to do. You have to believe that by acting this way, you're making the business better. And if you don't believe that, I don't think you belong on the leadership team at Cummins. Because I believe that's, the, that's what our legacy is. And so this tone at the top is how we say every single day in every meeting, this is, what we, this is what's important to us. So just give you a couple examples. We have an onboarding program that we've now taken on globally. So if you join Cummins, first thing you do is you register for this onboarding. We come in and we teach you all about the company. We give you some background about it. We teach you about your benefits. We get you a computer log on and all that kind of stuff. And then one of the leaders in our company visits and talks to your group and talks to you about our values and why they matter to us and how we make decisions with those values. So you can't get past square one without hearing some leader tell you it matters to them and give, them, give you personal stories for why it matters to them. And then when we talk about decisions, it's in my meeting room, it's unusual that we'll make a big decision where we aren't referencing one of our values to say, what does this value say about this? I would say it's more unusual that that doesn't happen. So they get used all the time. We, it's, it's actually kind of difficult to get fired for Cummins, from Cummins, except for not living up to the values. You, you can, you could be bad enough at your job you know, enough years in a row that, that you would either want to leave or be let go. But the easiest way to get fired is to not live with, by the values, not by missing your numbers. Again, that you might disagree with that as a strategy, but I think if you don't start, if you don't start with a good legacy that has a richness to it, and then you don't con consistently reinforce your values through how you act and how you decide, they are not going to stay there. People are not going to believe you. And then lastly, adherence. And th this is the one when we were talking about how many, you know, that we have a, an ethics and compliance group and that we have all these training and this kind of thing. This is what this is about. I know it sounds mundane, but you do have to check. If you are going to have 55,000 people and you're going to be stationed all over the world, you're going to have to check. Because if you don't, what happens is you have places around where they've just fallen apart. The leadership has not done the job they need to do there, and things are getting bad, and your reputation will be ruined before you know it. And of course, our board thinks our reputation's worth a lot. So that, that, that can't happen. Um, I'll just give you uh, one story about this. Um, when I was in Singapore, I was running uh, power generation, and I'd gone to Singapore for one of our trips. I met uh, our head of power generation sales in Vietnam, who was the coolest guy. He was a young guy, knew the market better than anyone I'd ever met. Vietnam's a difficult market, and he, but he had it wired. He knew the market like no one I'd ever met. And his sales were going up. He was doing really, really well. And he, he, you know, he, 
he just had the energy that I just loved. And so I was really excited to meet him, and I, I, I was so excited about our prospects there. Six months later, I found out that he was paying bribes. He was paying bribes. And so we terminated him. And I have to say, I don't say that with pride. It was really sad to me. This was a great guy who, in, I think, in any other environment, or many other environments, would not have thought paying bribes was what you need to do. It was, it's, it was endemic at the time at Vietnam, especially for government projects that you had to pay bribes. And I was sad to lose him, because our sales went from several million to zero, right? instantly zero. And by the way, he went to the competitor and sells, sold for the competitor, who I will not name, um, unless you ask me after. No, I, I won't name. Uh, but point is that if you don't live by it, you can't, it won't hold. People are always looking for chinks in the armor. So you have to drive adherence. So building the legacy, because it has to be rich and meaningful, tone at the top, talk about it every day. Leaders have to believe it at their core, and then you have to check. That's what I think makes it happen. OK. So before I close, I just want to say this, that um, I'm incredibly proud to be part of this organization. I do not think that I'm the reason by any stretch for why we have values and ethical practices that are so rich that they're what drive the company's success. But I'm proud to be part of it. And I really think of myself as a steward here at this point, at this time, and my job is to make sure that, that I leave this legacy stronger than I found it. That it's just as deep and just as meaningful and attracts people uh, of talent and, and, and wisdom and judgment and different perspectives from all over to come work for us and help us solve the problems of today. That's what I hope. And I would just say to the students that are thinking about this and that are trying to listen to, listen to Pat Murphy's words, is that begin to think about what you want to be known for. Because I, I think that's where it all comes down to. You, uh, you know, starting a new company, great, getting sales growth, um, achieving a new technical discovery, these are all things that are going to be important, but they're not going to stand the test of time on their own. How you treat people, what kind of uh, uh, ethical practice and reputation you leave behind, you know, what kind of steward were you for the people and the place and the assets and the technology that you got associated with, that's what will stand the test of time. And so begin to think about what that is. Who, is, who, who are you and what do you want to stand for? I think connects you with ethics and business leadership uh, like, uh, unlike any other question. So with that, thank you very much, and thank you again very much. Yeah. So I'm happy to take questions on, on anything, by the way. Any, anything I did not cover is also fair game. Um, I don't know if you mentioned this, but did you have any situations where someone came in, maybe they uh, didn't have uh, the strongest ethical values, and that was something that you kind of saw. But then you saw them grow to kind of uh, fit the company's uh, vision. I would say that I don't have good. I don't have a good story for that. And the, and maybe the reason is that I think if somebody, if I recognize somebody having values that don't match with the companies, I probably won't hire them. It doesn't mean that they sneak under, don't sneak under the radar. Because <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't think, uh, and by the way, it's, you know, we don't have a, there's not an acid test. There's no way to tell, for example, whether somebody has high integrity you know, when they interview. Um, you know, you, you, they know our values. And most of that, I think, is on self-selection at the start. And we try to ask people questions so that if, if, you know, that, that, that if they want to fail, they can fail. But it's mostly discovered on the job. And I would say, as a young person, when I started working, I would have been, I don't, you know, I wouldn't have been able to speak specifically to how I connect with all those values in exactly the right language. That it does come with time, how you understand that. So I don't think my expectation is that everybody gets it all the way down to their core on the first day. Um, but I do think inconsistency with our values at the start would mean not hiring. So I think I, that's why maybe I don't have a good story for that. Good question. Other questions? Yeah? How would you implement your vision, mission, your values into companies that obviously you are starting for your advisory role, like your board of directors position? Is that something that you look for in the companies that you join, or is that something that you look for as a new role? 
It's a great question. It's, it's partly what got me to that simple framework is because, of course, on a board or where you're in an advisory role, you don't get as much time as when you're a CEO. When I, as a CEO, you know, that my, my friends will listen to me as long as I'm standing there, right? Even if they have to take a quick break, they, 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 they'll listen to me. But it's not true in these boards and advisory. You have X number of minutes to make your point. Um, so I began to think, try to think about shorter letters. What, what really is it about? And so what I do when I'm on those is try to ask them about those things. So what are, what are your legacy of values and how do they connect to the spirit or how do they connect to who you are as a company? So when you talk to your employees and what, who are you and what does that have to do with how you operate? Not just what you do, but how you do it. And then secondly, I ask, and how, how do you exemplify that tone at the top? And what, do you, what are you talking about in your meetings? Do you ever talk about this stuff? And then I look for adherence. And of course, on, I'm on the audit committee of, of, of the, the board of Harley, so we look for adherence data too. And again, I, I, I don't want to overemphasize the adherence data. I think you know, there are, the reason I don't, is everyone needs a system. You've got to have one. If you don't have one and you get, and something happens like you get a, an FCPA, a you know, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, you, you'll lose and you'll go to jail. So you've got to have a system. There's no question about it. But it's not enough. It's necessary but not sufficient. You need the other two things with it, or else you know, you'll find yourself just, uh, uh, people will be violating a lot because they, you, you know, you're catching them doing things that they didn't even know they weren't supposed to do. And so I think the other, all three go together. So that's, that's what I try to do is make sure they've got them, and then um, you know, let them implement them in their own way is, I guess, the way I'd say, because our legacy is different than their legacy. Good question. Yeah. Uh, do you feel that Right. Some of these things may uh, be considered the cost of business. Mm. That's a great, great question because we do, um, we approach our presence in different countries as we want to be of that country. So when we're in India, we want to be an Indian company. And in China, we want to be a Chinese company. Because we, and we say that because we want to you know, employ the talents of, of people from there, not just ship a bunch of Americans over there. Secondly, we want to uh, relate to customers in the way that they feel like they, can, um, they, want to, they want to be served. And we believe that we can do that and still maintain the common, common piece, which is these values. Because every company has to decide what, what's different in all of our places and what's the same. And we've decided that the same part, the part that makes Cummins Cummins, is the values. So we definitely want to be of that place, and we want that common thing of values. And what makes you have to train differently or think differently is that the surrounding culture is not the same. And, and for example, when I do my, my, my checking in my adherence section, about, what I find is that the kind of ethical violations or, or fraud things that happen differ by country what the most common is. And it's not as simple as, well, there's lots in West Africa and not very many in the US. In fact, you know, because of our number of employees, we have more in the US than other places. But they're just different type. And so, and I, a lot of that has to do with the surrounding, what, what's acceptable things to do uh, from a surrounding point of view. I'll, I'll just give you one short story. When I met the head of power generation sales, again, back in my power gen leadership days in Nigeria, He's a big guy, Okichi, he's a super guy, and he was talking to me about when he interviews and hires sales guys, he had just come out of these interviews, and it's hard to find salespeople, and he said, this guy seemed great, um, and I, found, I got to the interview, and I said, by the way, you know, we don't pay bribes when we sell our generators, and the guy looked at him and said, wait, what else do you do? <laughs> well, okay, we're not as far along as I thought, right? So there, needless to say, so what we had to train there was, it wasn't that he wasn't aware that Paying bribes is not necessarily a good thing for the society or the world, and he didn't want to live in, a, in the place that did it. The question is, he didn't know what else to do to sell, because the guy's going to ask one. And if everyone else is paying, what do you do? I mean, do you dance, or what, I mean, what, what happens now? Right? You've got to have something to do. So we had to do a lot of sales training to, on technical sales to show, hey, here's what you can tell him, and here's who you should go talk to three levels above him about what you're offering. And that's, that's the way we do it. But yes, it is definitely, the, the stand, we are standard training for everyone, but then there's different things you need to do to make it successful in, in each place. Same question. Right. Okay, good. 
All right, other questions? Probably between you and dinner. Please. Uh, pollution is a serious problem. Yes. In certain parts of the world. I think in Beijing and Shanghai, in China. Uh, Commons has done a lot of research on that. Where does it all stand, and what do you see for the future? Uh, are you buying alternate energy, or is, uh, can you find these lunches that don't have a particular shadow? It's a great question. So, so as, as was mentioned, we have a sustainability report, and we committed ourselves um, back in this uh, the, the the 2002 set of uh, vision, mission, values that everything we do is going to lead to a cleaner, healthier, and safer place. Now, if you think about that for a diesel engine company, that brings up some challenges, right? Because what you sell emits both CO2. In, in large amounts, and also has uh, pollutants in it. So the question is, if you're going to clean or health, how, how are you going to make that thing square? And so what we committed ourselves to was developing technologies that would allow our products to still be economically viable, so people could still use them to do work that matters to people, that creates wealth, but would be de you know, decreasing its imp negative impacts on the society be they uh, criteria pollutants or CO2 or um, waste or other things. So that's what we've been on this. And that's basically what our sustainability report talks, talks about. It talks about the impact of our engines, and it talks about the impact of our, of our supply chain and our facilities. On the engine side, uh, we, of course, spend a gigantic proportion of our research and development dollars on how to make the products more fuel efficient and have less criteria pollutants both of which you know, are impacting the planet. What's more, though, we go to countries around the world and try to impact their regulations to make them more stringent. And of course, this is another win-win for us. When they do that, we think the people that live there get a better life. I mean, in, in China today, my biggest worry about doing business in China is, sub is submitting my folks to the air outside. The fact is that it's very, very unhealthy. And by the way, as terrible as Beijing and China is, at least 13 cities in India are worse. And we have a large number of employees in both India and China. Um, when I was at, I was at last um, two Christmases ago, I spent uh, time in India with my, my kids and my wife, because I love India, and I, I, I've never been able to take them there before. And I met our head of India, and his, his sister was there, and she lives in Delhi with her two children. And I, as I was going there, I read an article that said, um, if a child is raised in Delhi today, they will lose, on average, five years on their lifespan due to air pollutants, lung disease from air pollutants. So this is when it hit home. Met this woman and said, what are you going to do about this? So we've, again, we've gone beyond just what are we going to do in our engines and what are we going to do in our plants to say, what else can we impact? Can we impact the government to make regs more difficult? Can we bring together coalitions of industry to say, what else? So we, we launched an initiative called Clean Air Delhi that's trying to get all the people, ag burning, watering roads, all the elements of industry and stuff to try to get in and do things. Again, we, we don't, we're not naive and think we can fix all the problems, but we know things about this, and I think we're serious economic players. So our idea is to keep driving this to say, what can we do to keep building wealth but impacts of the planet down? And I would say China's very serious about this, to your specific question. They are definitely putting in regs. They are definitely taking actions. But you know, they're where Los Angeles was 25 years ago. I mean, it's, it's a long way to go. We made it. I mean, LA is not perfect, but it's, I mean, having been a college student there, it's not what it was 25 years ago. It's a lot better. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that they can make improvements. And I think uh, we all need to be part of it with our technology, with our influence, because it, it, it is, it is, it's very, very unhealthy. Uh, so it's it really important. Thanks for that question. OK, I'm probably between you and either beer or dinner. So um, I think I'll probably call it. But again, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am. Thank you very much for this recognition for all our comments. Thank you. By the way, th this is a bike accident. That's what, that's what happened. It was very awkward. In but case you're right. wondering. Yeah. Uh -oh. So we're uh, coming to the conclusion, but I want to first thank Tom for his excellent acceptance speech, and I've long felt that uh, Cummins was one of the 
best and most ethical companies uh, in the world, and I think uh, his speech confirmed that and very deserving of the Hesburgh Award. So thank you for attending this year's Cahill Lecture and Hesburgh Award. I uh, hope you can enjoy uh, what's left of this beautiful afternoon. Thank you very much.